there was a monkey, restless by his own nature, as all monkeys are. As if that were not enough, someone made him drink freely of wine, so that he became more restless. Then a scorpion stung him. When a man is stung by a scorpion, he jumps about for a whole day. So the poor monkey found his condition worse than ever. To complete his misery, a demon entered into him. What language can describe the uncontrollable restlessness of that monkey? The human mind is like that monkey, incessantly active by its own nature. Then it becomes drunk with the wine of desire, thus increasing its turbulence. After desire takes possession comes the sting of the scorpion of jealousy at the success of others. And last of all, the demon of pride enters the mind, making it think itself of all importance. How hard to control such a mind. That's a well-known quote from Swami Vivekananda, 19th century um, Indian philosopher, Swami, um, who essentially <clears throat> opened Hinduism up to a wider Western audience, particularly here in the United States. But, uh, you know, it was, I think it was the British who, who pioneered this, although maybe the Germans did. But anyway, the point is, this metaphor is of, of the monkey as the mind is something I think that anyone who has attempted to meditate or attempted to engage in any kind of inner self-examination um, runs into. Get a Western person to sit still with their eyes closed in an upright position for an hour. And I'll show you a very rare Westerner who can do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he wasn't referring to Westerners here, but it's just, you know, we like to pillory ourselves that way in the modern West. We can't, we need to be distracted all the time. Um, I think that the, um, the metaphor is apt. The mind does what it wants. Um, but the central point I'd like to make here is the way that the mind is pictured. The mind is a thing, and something is trying to control the thing. <laughs> um, the mind is a monkey. Something is trying to control the monkey. Or the monkey is trying to control himself. There is a differentiation here between the mind and that which seeks to gain mastery over it. This does not require religion. This point does not require religion to be made. To discuss it. <laughs> um, when you're trying to control your own mind, your own restless mind that seems to be rebelling against its master or against something that is attempting to master it, <clears throat> what is taking place? I won't say what I believe to be that which is attempting to gain mastery over the mind in here, um, I don't really have that much of an opinion on what it actually is. Pure consciousness? I don't know. But if you've ever attempted to settle your mind down and get it to be still, you understand that metaphor of the monkey. <clears throat> Another metaphor that the Indians use, the Hindus in particular, is that of a chariot. The charioteer stands in the chariot, holding on to the reins. Each one of the horses is one of the senses. And I suppose the reins could be the mind. But the charioteer is that which seeks to control all of them. The mind, the senses, everything. Self-discipline. How does one, in a purely materialistic conception of the mind or the brain or consciousness or whatever, explain that? 
explain the sort of process that takes place, if I may use a rather ludicrous metaphor of my own, of a cowboy trying to calm a skittish horse that has not been broken yet. But he wants to calm it the right way. He doesn't want to just beat it into submission. He wants to calm it down and get it used to being in contact with humans. <clears throat> the cowboy is the whatever, that which seeks to control, that which seeks to discipline. And the skittish horse is that which seeks to rebel against control. Something in that dynamic is struggling with something else. The mind is struggling to not be controlled, and that other thing <laughs> is trying to master the mind. There is a conflict taking place. <clears throat> Metaphorically, it's the, the monkey, and I don't know who the master would be in that case. It would just be uh, somebody trying to calm the monkey down, I suppose. But in the chariot metaphor, it's very clear the charioteer is attempting to control the mind, and through the mind, he's attempting to control the senses. Something is attempting to achieve ascendancy, if not mastery, over all the rest. I suppose if I were a religious man, I'd say the soul, or in the Hindu sense, the Atman, or Jiva, or whatever. I don't know. I'm not really sure what I would call that. Um, <clears throat> of all people, Aaron Ra once said to me, in just a comment, okay, something's happening here. There's something going on. I don't know what it is, but something is taking place. Um, the reason why I shy away from discussing the ultimate nature of that which seeks to control, i.e. the charioteer or the cowboy, <laughs> um, is the fact that it's very difficult to get at that thing, if it, if it indeed is a thing. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a throat cold. The Upanishads refer to the seer of that which is seen, the hearer of that which is heard, the knower of that which is known. What is that? What is it that is on the receiving end of all these impulses, of all these, all this information from the outside? And what is it that seeks to impose its will on other things? One could say it's simply the will itself. Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. Um, that's, you know, one could say that calming the skittish horse or the charioteer, trying to control the horses through the reins, is the will to power, I suppose. That's the way Nietzsche would describe it. You know. But in any event, the issue is there's something else inside the general framework of what we would call the mind, the spirit, the inner life, whatever. That, is, that we can say is seeking to master that which is other than itself, but is also inside the mind. <clears throat> Words start to fail and fail miserably at this point. Yet we want to explore this idea. We want to explore this idea of some sort of inner struggle taking place between self-discipline and chaos. Self-discipline is something I'm big on, and I mentioned uh, earlier that that's kind of one of the few positives to come from my insane Catholic education. You learn self-discipline, whether you like it or not, <laughs> when you're forced to go to Catholic school. Um, and what is self-discipline? What is it that is trying to discipline what? Um, what is that thing that is trying to discipline the mind? It's in there with the mind, and it's in, sort of, it's grappling with it. There's a fight going on, a conflict. 
<clears throat> what is that? Well, <laughs> good luck trying to describe it. But what if you still want to talk about it? What if you still want to discuss it and try and figure out what its attributes are? Or even if it exists in the same way as other things exist? What if you simply want to explore the dynamics of that inner struggle? And you want to sort of be able to refer to the protagonists and the antagonists in this struggle, this inner struggle, for the mind to calm itself down, to, to discipline itself. What are the two parties in that struggle? What are the many parties, perhaps, in that struggle? You can't use human language to discuss that, I think, in my opinion, without it sounding like religion. But is it religion? Swami Vivekananda's quote, which I will put in the bar below, doesn't refer to religion at all. But I rather suspect when he first gave the lecture, of which this little quote is a part, he probably enjoined his <clears throat> extremely upright Protestant Anglo-American audience to sing a little bhajan with him, a little song to God or to whatever, maybe to Lord Ganesha. And then he went into this uh, discourse on the nature of the mind and the, the nature of that inner struggle between two entities <clears throat> that may not really be entities in the way that we normally discuss such terms. How else can we engage in a discourse whose ultimate aim is, to, uh, is essentially to calm the mind down so the mind can see itself clearly? The mind sees itself. That still implies two things. One could, of course, use the metaphor of two mirrors held up against each other, where it's just sort of each mirror is seeing another mirror, and you get this sort of tautological um, starting point. But still, even then, something is on the receiving end of it all. Something is perceiving all of this. So how do we control that which perceives the perceptions? Or how do we how does that which perceives the perceptions control the way at which the perceptions come at it? That I don't think we can approach yet with Western science. Whether we like it or not, we have to engage in something that suspiciously looks like mysticism. Unless, of course, one would rather just not approach the subject at all. 